Welcome back, listeners, to Learning from Friends. It is a pleasure to have you join us here today, as you are sure aware of. Is My name is Kay Curtis, your tour guide on this lovely adventure. If this is your first time hearing this podcast or joining in, thank you for coming in and listening. If you are a returning listener, welcome back. It is glad to have you here with us today to listen to this lovely conversation that I'm going to have here. I'm coming down towards the end of my summer recordings. I've started in June and I'm going through the middle of July of recording 13 different people that I'm going to have that are going to be on the podcast throughout the year because of I released bi-weekly, but some episodes, just to give you guys a heads up, are going to be two-parters where I'm going to release back-to-back weeks. That gives you a little bit of information that's going on here for having some in the bucket, as I like to say. Have something in advance here. So as those listeners that have been here with me before, that you know, I start off the episode with quotes from my mother that she sends in order to brighten my day or to share some little bits of knowledge and wisdom. So this one comes from Maram Hasna. It is some people will have a problem with you just because you move differently than the crowd. They assume that means you're judging them when in reality, you're just busy and joining your freedom. Great quote. Wonderful things. Be an individual. Be yourself. Don't worry about someone else judging you for being you at the end of the day and love everyone. That's just kind of the way that I interpreted that reading. Thanks, Mom, for sending that and continuing to share this lovely knowledge with us today. So on the episode today, I'm speaking with Rodney, whom I met through bowling, a continual of people that I've met through bowling leagues, and when we're playing our time there, as we continue to kind of talk, he sought me out. It was kind of fun talking with me and catching up with me, and we brought up the idea of talking about the podcast. And as we continue to talk, I learned more and more about him and some of the things that he is very interested in. And the topic we're going to really talk today really intrigued me. And I go, hey, man, you need to come on to Learning From Friends and talk about this. He's an investor. He's only two years into this, but his dedication that he wants to be the best, he's so competitive in nature that he absorbs this knowledge and throws all his time into it to become really knowledgeable about it. So what we're going to do today is he's going to sit down and talk about these different types of investing and just in general, what each one of them means. Now, disclaimer here, he's not telling you advice of this is what it is, this is what you need to do. This is just a conversation that we're having about these different types of things out there. Now, I may ask his opinion on some stuff, but that does not mean, hey, you go out there and you buy XYZ stock or you do XYZ as a result of this. This is just a conversation that we're having. Do not come back and try to sue us saying, well, I did this and this did not work. So. Just putting that out there. It's an honor to have you on the podcast today, Rodney. Welcome to Learning from Friends. Thanks, Kate. I appreciate all of this. This is great. Glad to be here. I love that you talk exactly how you already talk in conversation. That's awesome. This is amazing. I'm happy to be here, man. I, that's why I enjoy this. That's the best part about Learning from Friends. Whenever people are listening to it, they go, yeah, you just sound like yourself. I am myself. I'm not going to turn on some radio voice to be able to go through and make up this fake, fake act. That's not me because that's not my personality. That's not my person who it is. So Rodney, 99.9% of people have no clue who you are that's listening to this podcast. Can you paint us a visual picture for our listeners of who is Rodney? All right, cool. I actually have a great picture of myself already on Google. Look up Donald Glover, Childish Gambino. That's the main guy that I look like in any public space. But me as a person, interesting. I'm a, I'm a bowler. As you know, I'm very competitive in my bowling. I want to, within the two years you know I've already been bowling, I want to have a 300 game at least somewhere between now and next year. Good luck. Coming in already. Say. And you've already said that's crazy to think of doing. Other than that, I just told you earlier, I've been to engineering school. I have five years experience in engineering school. Didn't finish because I thought there was more money in what I'm doing now. But I loved it. I love engineering. I love all things mechanical. I love everything physical about sports. I love every kind of sport there is. And investing is all math for me. So I've done a bunch of maths in engineering school. So doing more math is just normal for me. So this is just something I felt like I naturally came into. So it's something fun now. Yeah, competitive nature mixed with math, mixed with being able to prove someone wrong. That's that's And make a living off and of make, it. There you go. And yep. make a living off of it. That's like the perfect combination for you. 24 years old. Yep. You have a whole entire life ahead of you and yeah. you can build an empire right that here is the goal. starting that is right the here goal. at this young age and yep, yep. earlier you start 
the more possibilities you have to be able to grow something. This is, and I'm going to go on a side little tangent here real quick. For children, you can set up a custodial account. If you have a child that could have an account at the age of literally months old, as long as they have a social security number, you can set up for them and do investing for them and turn it over to them at 18, 21, a great 27. Idea. And that's not a college account. That could just be a general trading account. You could also set up a 529, which is a specifically for college as well as soon as they have a social security number for that. So just thoughts that you could be able to do that as well. The more knowledge you can be able to provide your kids at a younger age, you're building generational wealth right there. I second everything he just said. <laughs> it's true. So there's a lot of misconceptions out there. I mean, they're everywhere of how people look at trading. What have you noticed of trends that people have of misconceptions of trading? And I want to hear your response to those people. I think the main misconception I've seen is that trading is risky. And trading itself is a practice in risk management. That's what it should be. That's what it's always been. Every person that's ever been involved in trading or investing of any kind is practicing risk management. So if you're thinking, most people that usually talk to me about the fact that they're not investing, is the risk involved in investing? If your main thing coming in is to manage risk, then you know what kind of investor you are and you know what you're looking to do. As long as you know what you're looking to do, what your goals are, what your income level is, that risk is not there. You don't lose money until you sell. Yeah. Yeah. If it's at a negative. Yeah, for sure. Be, be ready for the long game if I have to. Yeah. That's the thing. Now, what is investing? What, what does that mean? Cool. So investing to me is involvement in someone else's enterprise of any kind, whether it's stocks, options, cryptos, NFTs, certificate of deposit, all those things are all investments in someone else's enterprise of any kind. Because most investments, somebody else has money somewhere in a group or specifically a small group of people, depending on if you're talking about mutual fund or ETF, if anything like that, there's just a group of people that have money pooled together already. And you're saying, I want to pool my money together with them and have a piece of the pie in terms of the profits that they make off of that investment, which is what we're talking about. Exactly. And each individual company, they have to, in order to raise capital, they've got to put themselves out there too. And if they've gone public. Yeah. So. And they're making you part of that group. Exactly. So yeah. And you, the more you buy, you could have more voice inside the company on that. They have certain levels. I more voice, Nintendo more has, choice. Yeah, I think for it's sure. that Nintendo has $40,000. You actually get a vote on, on, which is quite interesting. So the only reason why I know that is some YouTuber did that recently. Yeah. was He wanted to bring back F5 or F0 yeah, or whatever it was called. For sure. The that more was, shares you buy, the more control you have over what they do. Exactly. Now that control is dependent on the agreement you have when you buy shares. <laughs> but yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, it's interesting. That's the thing, when, especially when a company goes public. Like with uh, Elon Musk buying a Twitter, Twitter for yeah. sure. Yeah, That's a huge debacle that's going on. And we're in July, so who knows where this could be. And this gets released in November, December, yeah. January. For where sure. Where this could be. For sure. <laughs> Hello, future self I mean, from your past. We're saying hello. Hope you're doing well. Yeah, for uh, sure. <laughs> so how did you get interested in this field of investing? Because that's, I didn't really get interested. I will say myself personally until I was in my mid early, sorry, like 21, 22 kind of deal. I didn't. Got it. How did you get involved? Man, that's interesting. I started investing just two years ago because I found out there was money in it. I found out I had the necessary materials to do the research I wanted to do, and I had the time. I took out the time to do it, and I said, this is something I want to do. I know this math, and I want to take my time and figure this out. I want to figure this out. I want to not waste the time I spent in college. I don't want to waste the time I spent learning all this math that I was very bad at before college. <laughs> I was very bad at math before college. After college, I knew a bunch of math, and I kind of had all the materials necessary to figure out what I was going to do with investing coming in because we had a bunch of books on investing at home. My parents have always been interested in investing, but they weren't doing it. Like the stuff they were supposed to do for investing, they just weren't doing it. And I was like, we can do this stuff right now if we just read this stuff, take it and apply it and just do it over a period of time. We can make this money we're trying to make with the jobs we're already working and everything. We made the same amount in a very short period of time. Yeah, a lot of people are afraid to make that step. Yeah, that's exactly. that's a hard part of just stepping off, leaving that comfort zone of it. To, Taking to the risk. So. Yeah, yeah. Part of it is is just realizing, hey man, the money's there, don't touch it. Yeah. Like, let it grow. Yeah. And if it gets to the point where, hey, it's growing pretty high, and 
it's above market value. I'm going to go ahead and take it back and make, take my profit. I exactly. mean, there are taxes that do yeah, come from this, for sure. but uh, the way I look at it from my, my way of it is I go, that money's there. I put it there because of, I don't need it. I need it to work for me. Yeah. That money needs to be working for me yeah. to be able to make me a profit for it. Yeah. If it's sitting in my bank account, it's making 0.001% or whatever the number is. Yeah, 0.002 for sure. That's yeah. a real number. Yeah. It, exactly. If it's, yeah. it, that's not working for me. That's just, that's a holding place. Yeah, for sure. Like I, w- I want my money to be making me one, two, ten percent and I want to see it grow. Now, what types of investing are you involved with? Currently, I'm mainly involved with stocks and options. Those are the main ones I do daily. I've looked into all the other types that we're going to talk about, but the main ones I still do right now currently are stocks and options because those are the only ones I see the highest ROI in, which is return on investment. Now, you mentioned books and information around you. What mm-hmm. books, what websites, groups, or other ways that of the last two years that you have used to gain information? Mm-hmm. Okay, so... I did a lot of research with physical media. Like I had Wall Street Journal books that I read. I had some Wired magazines that I read that had some investment stuff in them. Read the whole thing of those. I went on very few websites, actually. I did very little online research because I felt like there are so many people always talking about investing online and there are so many opinions online. With the books, it gave me a foundation. So I wanted a foundation outside of the internet where everybody's kind of flooding you with opinions on what to do. And I wanted some foundational knowledge from back in the day, Dave Ramsey type stuff. Dave Ramsey, another book I read. And I wanted to be able to read those things, take my time and say, here's the foundation. And then let me go hear other people's opinions once I have a foundation to build on top of. Yes. Looking at the scholarly portion of it. For sure. We have so much flooded information out yeah. there of, of opinion base that's mm-hmm. there that is very true what's funny is i'm marking down he, he i told him earlier about how to like have his hands at a certain space currently uh, he's at nine so uh, at 10 yeah 10 oh 10 so yeah uh, i'm marking off on this so I, I i saw that you looked over at me when i'm marking so i had to make that little joke here but yeah that's smart i really like that from an active perspective knowledge on facebook knowledge on tiktok Looking at um, Yahoo News, looking at these other news sources, you don't know per se where that's coming from and what their opinion may be because it really it's more at that point an opinion. Eleven. Don't want me to say out loud each time it gets there. No, I'm but, just joking with you. <laughs> but yeah, it's an opinion based, and you yes, a scholarly is an opinion, but they've got a backing behind them mm-hmm. of showing this research that may have been two, five, ten years to explain that rather than a one minute, one day one month, one year bits of information. Yeah. And it's usually a group of people that are coming together to do that. And there are a bunch of scammers that are on there yes. saying, here's how you invest this and it never works out because they're scamming you out of money. Which is unfortunate because there's that, it's like almost like a pyramid scheme idea of, hey, yeah. if you volunteer this person to come in, we're going to pay you money. Oh, no, yeah, we're going to introduce this topic to you, but we're going to introduce this point. And oh, yeah, if you want to join us at this next level to get some more information, it's going to be another $2,000. And they're just, exactly. it tags you along. It's a real thing. Now, do you have any mentors yourself that have been helpful and useful? Because you said at one point you read like Dave Ramsey's book yeah. and things like that. I've had physical mentors a few times. I still have one guy I talk to regularly, but a lot of my original mentors, they've kind of ended up doing other things. So I have one guy I talk to. He's like, he works at one of my bowling alleys, actually, one of the other bowling alleys oh, cool. I go to. He's kind of been doing some mentoring for me, just knowing things that I wouldn't normally find in my books or things like that. Just real world knowledge he has. That's cool. Shout out to AMF Woodstock Bowling Lanes. That's kind of for our, sure, for our sure. meeting place. But no, that's good to have those people in our lives that kind of put you there. And you mentioned earlier that your parents already had books kind of in the house mm-hmm. that were there. That's kind of a baseline as well for like some mentorship when you think about it. Yeah. Hey man, they, they kind of allowed me to kind of get that that spot in a place here. Now for yourself, reading this material, what misconceptions did you have yourself before going into trading that these books kind of helped clear up that to start a foundation? That's a tough one. I thought that investing was a very confusing thing that you don't really know how to do unless you're already an investor or a broker or a mutual fund worker. I thought that was just something that you had to already have this pre-knowledge coming in. Otherwise, you can't do it. And that's not true. 
what what happens is if you know what type of investing you want to do and you do your own research and you set your own goals, you can't invest. But if you're trying to do the highest level of investing coming in, it's not going to happen because you, you, you literally can't hit the highest level until you've done the research, taking your time and set your goals. Bigger groups have bigger goals because they have more money, they yeah. have more research and they have more time. That's true. It's kind of like learning. I'm going to use the metaphor of shooting basketball. You're not going to be able to walk out there and be LeBron James. LeBron James put in hours upon months, weeks, years in order to get to where he's at. And he's playing at such a high level of where he's at. And that's why he's there to get to that point. He just, he didn't just walk on the court and do it. So you got to put it in the time to make it happen. Now that's jump into, we're going to jump into the different types of investing here. The first one we're going to start off with is within the stock market. What are stocks, what are mutual funds, ETFs, CDs, bonds? Like, What are those things? Cool. There's a lot of so, words. Yeah, they are. There, There's multiple words you're saying to me about different types of investing. So just to start off, I'm going to go down the list. Stocks are a portion of ownership in a current company's functioning. So you you get to decide... I want to own this much of what they're doing or this much of what they're doing. And you decide that about how many shares you buy. What happens with mutual funds is there's a very large group of people that have their money already pooled together and you're buying into their buying of shares. So you're saying, I want to be part of what you're already doing in this group when you have a lot of them buying what are called blue chip stocks, which are the bigger ones like Apple, Tesla, yeah, Facebook, all the big ones. They have funds of just the big ones that you can buy into, which is harder for retail investors to get into. Most retail investors aren't able to buy multiple shares of those stocks on their own. So with mutual funds, they give you access to that when you normally wouldn't have that. Yeah, that's definitely, yeah, especially when I think it's Facebook and Amazon are like thousand plus dollars to be able to buy one share. For sure. And if you can be able to buy, say a hundred dollars and buy into that, you have a portion. Yeah. And they're able to give you varied but substantial portions of those that you can afford, essentially. Yep. It puts out uh, a great level. And you may own portions of like 75 different stocks within yeah. that mutual fund. For me, ETFs are giving investors, retail investors or non-retail investors, the ability to buy into specific kinds of stocks, whether that's electric vehicle stocks, just mechanical type things in the stock market. If you want to buy just tech stocks, that's what ETFs are all about. I have one in cryptocurrencies because I don't like the idea of buying individual cryptocurrencies, yeah. which we'll discuss later. Yeah. But I like you can the buy specific groups of things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I like that. And the mutual funds and ETFs, they're a group of things, but they trade differently. Well, how do they trade differently? So mutual funds trade differently because, like I said, with the blue chips, when you're investing in blue chips. There's only so much, like I said, you get a portion of what they're getting, but you kind of come in with a certain agreement of you get this percentage profit from what they're buying because they only have those things. ETFs, when that group of stocks in tech or whatever else, when those are, when you buy those, they're just those EV stocks or whatever else, and you get the profit from all of those things. So what is what happens is instead of benefiting from only one blue chip at a time in that group. Because when all the big ones go down at one time, you lose out on that. With ETFs, if you're in one group like EVs, when all those go up, you make a lot. If if you don't make a bunch off those, that group is still going to have winners. Yeah. With the blue chips, if they're not winning, they're not winning from what I've learned. With ETFs and EVs, just specifically sectioning on those, with those, there's always going to be a winner in them because they're such a new market that you're able to kind of access that. And there will always be winners because it's so new. Somebody's always going to be investing in that. Blue chips are long-term. So yeah. mutual funds are for long-term investment. ETFs, you can get into new stocks, a mix of older and newer, and then anything else you're interested in right now. That goes a heavily long way in something that my brain just thought about as well of a separation between mutual funds and ETFs. Mutual funds trade at the end of the market day. Mm-hmm. Like they're bought at the end of the day. ETFs trade during the middle of the day. So you can see the stock kind of ETF going up and going down to the middle of the day. And you can sell it, say if it's at $22 and you're like, hey, I can sell it at 2201 is where my threshold's willing to sell it. Yeah. During the middle of the day with a mutual fund, 
you can say, hey, I want to sell it, but you don't know what it's going to be at that end of the day when it shuts down. Yeah. Because that price is going to change. It may go up. It may go down. But it happens right at the end of closing. For sure. <laughs> that, that's yeah, that's why sell. pre-market and after hours are very important when you're looking at ETFs. You can access that etf wise, And like you said, mutual funds is not there. Because it's blue chips, you don't really have the opportunity for them to be much fluctuation. You're you're looking long term. Yeah. So long term, you know you're gonna make some kind of profit in the maybe twenty to thirty percent. With ETFs, it can go anywhere throughout the day, like you just said. Now, do you know about dividends? How do dividends work for like certain stocks? Dividends happen in it depends on how they put them out. Like so dividends no matter what. Certain stocks, if you hold them for long enough, most stocks give you dividends. What happens is getting your dividends, it's yearly, quarterly, bi-monthly, different things like that, depending on the company and how they do their shares. Because if you hold a certain amount of shares, you probably get more dividend from that company, depending on how their agreement is on how much equity you get from them when they put out this how many, this is how many shares we're going to put out in general. This is how many pe- shares people can own. And then when you own this many shares, this is how much of the actual dividends you get back is usually what happens. Yeah, that's one of those things that some people, I think it's called DRIP, where it's the direct reinvestment. I can't think of the other two acronyms are for it, but they do it and say, I'm automatically going to reinvest my yeah, dividends you, you, back you, in. You know you're going to be able to do that when you buy that share. Yes. Most platforms will tell you, hey, you have the option to reinvest this. Yeah. Like Robinhood, the platform I use, does that very well. And there's some places that, hey, if you don't want to, they'll send they, you like, hey, every quarter we can send you a check in the mail. It exactly. may be 25 cents. It exactly. may be $5, but you have those different options. And that's why one people really solely work on dividend stocks. Yeah. Just, and it's that's all, all dependent on the platform you use to invest. Yes. Exactly. Sure. Heavily. Now, CDs. Okay. What is a CD? So a certificate of deposit is similar to, we talk, we're going to talk about bonds in a minute. Certificate of deposit and bonds are pretty similar. You're essentially saying, here's some money I want to have value and hold its value for a certain period of time. So they give you, you you give them money and they say, here's your certificate of deposit or your receipt for that amount of money. And you'll have that amount of money and it'll hold its value for a certain period of time. And later on, you're able to pull that money out after like a certain period, you can pull it back out and say, hey, I want this back. And what it is, the reason why you do a CD versus a bond or anything else is it holds your money at that value so that you don't lose anything in inflation or anything else. Or it's just held there so you don't touch it to a certain period of time where it can appreciate at a, a, a pretty conservative rate. You'll, you'll make some money off of it, but it's really just to hold money for you. Like you do with a 401k or a Roth IRA or anything else. You don't hold that money there and have some kind of return on it versus doing something more risky if you're a more conservative type of investor. Yeah, isn't it somewhere like sometimes one up to like 3% really? They don't, yep. CDs don't get yep. really that big no, in terms not of percentages. It's just holding your money at a certain value, which we'll talk about later with some other things, but it holds your money at a certain value so you know your money's there at this value outside of the market, outside of anything that'll touch it so that no matter what, you'll have some money that's at this value when you put it in there. So it can be like, hey, anything. I can do one year, three year, five year, 10 year, something like that yes. on time frames. Now, can I touch that money Say if we're three years into a five year CD, can I touch that money? Or I think no? you can. I think you could pull it out, but there's a fee, gotcha. for sure. Because after a certain period, you can pull all of it out. But up until a certain time, you have to wait. You either have to wait or you pay a fee for it. But it's still there. Yeah, isn't it called like matured? Is that I think that's the word that they something use like that? Your yeah. CD has matured. Yeah. Now, bonds. Okay. What are bonds? So bonds are essentially you trading your money for the government's promise of you getting that money back eventually in a certain other form of your bonds. Essentially, you're saying, hey, government, I want my money to be backed by you. So here's a certificate they give you your bonds that say, hey, your money's worth this for this period of time until you decide that you want to pull that money out. So are they paying you a percentage as well of saying, hey, we're going to give you one It's a similar percentage to certificate of deposit, yeah. Now, I know that with these bonds, most of the time they're very specific of saying the government's like, hey, I'm working on some roadway systems. This is going to yeah. go towards paying for yeah. these roads. Or, hey, this is a military bond. Because I know we sold a lot of during World War I, World War II, yeah. military bonds to be able to yeah. help out. Now, and can a- Because the government wanted a certain amount of money for a thing, they'll give you that bond saying, hey, this money is going to be worth this. So please give us money so we can use the money for this, but you'll get it back. Yeah. It's a promise they'll give it back to you. 
are they required to give that money back to you? Say if that project fails and they don't make yes. any money off of it, they're required to give That's it to why you. you have the bond. The bond guarantees the bond, like I said before, the bond is the promise that you'll get your money back, either at the value you got it or a little bit above it, like, like I said with the CD, the percentage you get back. For sure, you'll get money back. That's all they're really saying. We want your money, but we'll give it back to you. So banks for CDs, governments can be able to have or more for the bonds. So do you have a preference like for doing this? Do you have a lot of your stuff in stocks? Do you just mutual funds, ETFs, CDs, bonds? What are you looking at? Like I said before, I'm mostly in stocks and options because of the ROI from those things. Like I said, with bonds, CDs, or anything else, because I'm 24, I don't really have a benefit I'm going to gain from a CD or a bond or anything else that's a long-term type investment because I'm trying to make consistent moves to make a certain kind of profit. Most investments aren't for profit. Most investments are for retirement a lot of the time. Yeah. If you're coming into the market looking to make a profit of some kind, you have to kind of pick certain things and then move with those. Like for a while, that was crypto. Right now, it's not. That went up. That went down. Maybe it'll come back up. Who it's, knows It's, it's going to come back up. There's too many countries that have them like in, like directly involved in their actual currency markets now. Yeah, it's starting to starting to evolve. Now, we as America, I don't know. But <laughs> I know a lot of countries are using it for their currency now. And we will be discussing about that in a little while. So stick in here with us. Yep. We will be getting there yep, yep. on that. With a portfolio, that's what a lot of people say. Portfolio, you're having a mixture of these stocks, these mutual funds, these bonds, these ETFs. And that's, as you mentioned, he's young. He's 24 years old. He's looking at that return of investment or ROI right now early. As you get older, that's going to change on what you need. For so sure. he's meeting his needs. So right now, that's why he's more on those stocks and those kind of ranges because he's looking currently, he's able to have more risk For sure. available there. Now, how do they recommend when your age changes? What what do you look at to be able to better protect yourself? Because if you're not going to go, I'm going at, I'm 60 years old and I want to get another 30% of investments here and I'm going to go off the deep end and try to make all these high risks here that maybe I can get back in one year, but really it may take you five to 10 years to get. What? How do you recommend someone build a portfolio by age? Okay. So what you're describing is a conservative type investor. I'm more a risk type investor, but conservative investors will come in having a specific ROI goal of, like you said, 5%, something like that. And they'll know how much they're going to put in to invest and how much they kind of want to get out. If they know those things, they're coming in good. I would also say they need to do some research ahead of time before even touching any of the investments they're going to come into. Because for me, I'm a risk type investor, but I've done, I've done a lot of talks with conservative investors. And those are the main things they need. They need to know what their ROI goals are. They need to know how much they're willing to invest or lose. And then knowing what kind of research they need to do ahead of time for what they're specifically going to invest in. They need to know what they're going to invest in, how much they're going to put into that, and what they want to get out of that coming in. If you don't know those things, you'll be emotional. Yeah. If you don't know those things, you'll probably lose a lot. And if you're going long term, once you've made those specific decisions, you'll just keep making those same decisions over and over. You won't have to make many changes. And this is why some people really just need a advisor. Yeah. Some people don't need an advisor, depending upon how you're doing your research. Just be aware and understandable what the difference can kind of be when choosing that. Because whenever you're giving up some of that freedom of your choice, you may be getting yourself into, I'm going to throw this out here in our conversation quick, quick up, expense ratios. Yeah. For every stock you buy has an expense ratio. So say I am buying a mutual fund here. Sure. And typically a mutual fund can be anywhere from 0.0 to 0 0.00. Some of them are upwards of three, four percent. And what that's meaning is they're taking a percentage as a fee for running that mutual fund. So as a result, you may be paying three percent to own if it's expense ratio of three percent. You may be paying your stock may have only made four percent. Technically, your expense ratio took away three. So you've only made 1% yeah. on that. Yeah. Your report is going to show you you made 4%. But really, that expense, whenever it comes out, you're only making one. So you're like, wait a second, I only made like 10 bucks here, but it said I was supposed to make 40. What's that difference there? Yeah. So that's something you have to look at. And that's not something that's easily disclosed or put out there. And a lot of, I'm not trying to sound negative here, put anything out there for certain groups of people, but- Mutual funds 
a lot of organizations will like to put you into their mutual funds, their stuff. So at times they may have a higher expense ratio because they may be getting a commission back from that because they purchased you that. For sure. I'm not saying that's a good thing for, and I'm not saying it's actually a bad thing. For me, I am very extremely aware of my expense ratios that I get into. I personally use a lot of Vanguard funds. That's something that I- They're awesome. Yeah. And extremely low expense ratios uh, that come out there as well. So something to think about. That's something that you can look at for mutual funds and ETFs have those. Your stocks do have them, but it's very smaller amounts, but it's more focused in your mutual funds and ETFs because that's a group. It's a box. Someone's managing those funds. Exactly. Someone's having to make those purchases and sell those purchases there. Now, going in back backwards a little bit to the stocks, of do you have any favorites that have been really good to you lately? I've noticed that a lot of stocks lately that have been doing the best are stocks that are kind of just entering the market this year. So the small like. caps? That for sure, for sure, yeah. small caps. I mean, I've had... I didn't really see the GameStop stuff happening. Like I got in kind of at the end, the GameStop AMC like jumps because they just were so out of left field for everybody. I can't remember the term for that, but literally what it was, was it was a group of people proving them to, in order to disrupt the market. Yeah. That was not an actual like, the stock was this great. No, no, it was the people were going up against the market. Yeah, and they were showing entirely. people that investors have the power to do that. If we just yep. say, hey, retail investors can do Exactly what funds and everybody else is doing with these investments. But yeah. Exactly. Uh, I had Virgin Galactic did really good at one point for me. I liked that one a lot. Hasn't done very well recently, but when I first kind of got into the market, it was doing really great. As of late, uh, I've gotten to a lot of different kinds of stocks. Actually, a lot of different kinds of stocks that I normally wouldn't find doing well are doing well. Like I just today, I was investing in like a sushi stock. Okay. He was doing numbers, and I was like, oh, that's. Weird. I never really saw them doing that much. But yeah, when I first came in, it was like Virgin Galactic and a few of the cannabis stocks. Those have currently also had some trouble. Yeah, lately. they they had their big boom. Yeah, as well. Now it's sure. kind of waning because mm-hmm. the the market the market market For is sure. flooded. Yeah, that's the big thing that kind of comes up. So it's hard to find those trends here. Now, how do you choose a stock? Are you looking at the company individually? Are you looking at what's happening in their competition around it? What are you looking at this number wise? What do you, how do you choose? So when I choose a stock, this probably isn't the best, but hey, I come in, own, no, I come in actually looking at how much they've profited that day. I look for like a 30% profit margin for that day of that stock in general. 30% and above means I'm investing 30% or below. I'm not doing it because I know for sure already you've made enough money for me to put money in and make something. Yeah. Then I look at what the stock actually is, and I look at the name of it. I look at the market cap, all those kind of actual metrics you'll look at. I'll look at those right after that. Once I see 30%, I look at all the actual things they have to offer me as a stock, because that tells me what your volume probably going to be, who your investors probably already are, and how much I can make off of that stock, usually. Because a lot of times what will happen is if you come in looking at what the stock is who is investing in all that stuff that doesn't tell you that day what's going to happen with that stock sometimes. Yeah, that's very true. A lot of times that day what happens is news will come in about that stock from somewhere. Somebody's saying something about it or there's news about it and that'll influence what retail investors and the actual shareholders of that company are going to do with their shares that day. Most of the time, once you're hearing that news, it's a little too late. Yeah, <laughs> which is why you, you never want to go off of the news first. For me, I'll see the news right after and I'll go, okay, how much can I make off of this based on what's being talked about or what's happening with this company? Because like I even made, there was a recent coffee stock. I can't remember the name of it right now, but there was a coffee stock that made a bunch of money off of a lawsuit against them. So they should have been losing money, wow. but they were making money because a bunch of people, probably shareholders, were putting a bunch of money into it right before the like lawsuit came out because they know ahead of time. That you things you won't know about what's going on a lot yeah, of times behind the scenes, and they'll put money in and say, "Hey, let's get our money in and profit off this stock before everybody hears about the lawsuit and it drops." Insider trading, though, and some of that that's somewhat, somewhat yeah, some of yeah. no, that happened actually lately. I feel like these past two years, a lot of the stock stocks that I probably marketed money off of were just insider trading because people don't see. Retail investors don't see what's going on, but as an investor, you can see movement that shouldn't be there. And you're True. like, oh, cool. Let's, yep. uh, 
Let's do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's, uh, there's, there's a thing of analysis paralysis. Yeah. People can be overlooking that information. There's some people are looking at levels like, okay, once it reaches this level, it's broken its current trend of the past, like resistance. So now it's going to go up or, hey, that it's dropping and this is the last level it hit. So it's going to bounce back up. So there's, there's different and ways that, of looking at that it. stuff is good foundational knowledge that all investors should have. But the market now, because there's so many retail investors involved, sometimes that just doesn't happen. Where it'll drop, where it's supposed to keep going up, or to go up where it's supposed to drop, because people yeah. are getting in. Well, exactly. normally you won't have these retail investors involved in these these shares and trades. So yeah, and the market's forever changing. That's the thing. You have to evolve sure. with the market as it's going along. Now, have you had what's been some regrets in the markets that you made trades on? I think I just had too much faith in some companies at some points. Like you stated, like with blue chips or anything else, sometimes you're like, oh man, this stock is going to do great because this company is big. And like, if you look now with Netflix or other things where they were like up $700 a share, yeah. now they're at like 200 maybe. And like, that's a lot of loss that's for a, a company that's supposed to make a lot loss. of, because how much profit they're actually making is very different than what their shares or like their share profit yeah. and everything else is showing. Because really, I mean, I know what's happening. You look at, the money they've actually spent on projects versus the money they've actually made in profit, those numbers aren't the same. They're going to change yeah, for sure. And, and their popularities went down a little bit. That is a huge so. one as well. The popularity makes a huge difference. Yeah. Now, there are different platforms that are out there for people to invest in. I think Robinhood has really opened up the door for a lot of different people to invest in. And there's a bunch of different apps out there that weren't really there before for a lot of people to want to get into. And they've done exactly. a lot of big advertising and marketing in order to get you to do that. And exactly. I think it's become a lot easier as well. And they've got some that are out there, I can't think of the name of it, that now take your change and automatically invest it that Acorn. way. Acorns. Yeah, Acorn yeah. and stuff yeah. like that. Like That's, that's amazing. That's awesome, yeah. Yeah, that stuff that wasn't available. We're not saying use these apps, but we're just saying, hey, this is stuff that's out there. I was just on a call with somebody the other day that was trying to find out if they should get into using Acorn because they heard about it, they already had access to it. And I was like, yeah, it's something you could do. Yeah, why not? Just get started, yeah. Yeah, because I, I do something similar with Acorn. That's It's not the app. But what I do is I track my transactions. And every time that I swipe my card, it puts a dollar into another account. I take that Got dollar in or how many dollars it is at the end of the month and I invest it into yeah. whatever I want to put it into. But I know that that's, that's my money. You took the Acorn strategy. It. It's yeah, an Acorn like strategy. It. Yeah, like it's something it. that I was doing before. The app even existed. But that was something that was just, that was my mindset. That was my thought process. And so your banks offer that as options that are out there to do. And some credit cards actually do it as well for you. So some of those out there. I'm a Vanguard and TD Ameritrade guy. Yeah. That's what I use. Those, yeah. are, those are my two big ones that I, that I use a lot of. Now that's jump to another portion that this is something that I am completely 100% unfamiliar with. I do not understand this portion of investing. And I will not be interjecting by any means on this one because I do not know oh anything gosh. about the next three. Like I have the basic knowledge that I read about, but I'm yeah. like, I, I can't, I can't interject and add anything more. So if you yeah. don't know this answer, you go, Cade, I ain't got this. Cool. <laughs> Let's yeah. move on yeah. to it. What are options? I know there's two different types that are out there, yeah. like puts and calls. Yeah. What is that? So an option literally is just your ability to buy hundreds or above in numbers of shares at a time. So when you buy an option, put or call, you're saying, I want 100 shares that I expect to do good or bad. A put option is saying, I think this is going down. And I want to put in an investment of 100 shares or more to say this is going down by this much. And when it does that, you can make a maximized profit. That's the real idea behind options. Instead of buying a stock and buying 10 shares or anything below 100 shares, where you normally would see a lot of investors at, just retail-wise, instead of buying... 100 below shares, you're able to buy multiple bundles of shares at a time because you're saying, I know for sure this investment is going to do this. And when you know the metrics and you know everything else, then you're confident to do options. A lot of people aren't very confident in joining in, investing in options and anything like that because they're not confident in that stock's actual movements or what it's going to do. Call option is when you're saying, hey, it's going to go up by this much. And I know it's going to go up by this much. Because I've seen it do it before. You're going off your metrics or you're going off your confidence, whatever. But you're saying, I want to make the maximum amount of profit off this stock as I can, whether it goes down or up. 
And what happens is with option strategies, you mix calls and puts to say, I want, when it goes up, I want to make this amount. And when it goes down, I want to make this amount. Because you know, whether you're confident or not, it's going to go down and up. So you're making a bet on it going down and up at a certain level. But also what happens is, because they're options, it's a contract that expires at a certain point. So what happens is whether or not you have the confidence to buy it, even if you do, you have to be able to sell it back to the market within a certain time. Otherwise, you don't make a profit. So or, that's why there's a bid and ask. Exactly. I guess, in a- or you can exercise your option and say, hey, this amount of shares that I said I wanted of 100 or more, I have those. I keep it. And that's all I have. I just have 100 shares of that thing. Whatever amount of shares you came in and said you wanted to buy, you have those. What happens with the contract is that you mitigate a little bit of risk of losing money when the price fluctuates. Because when it expires at a certain point, you make zero money. If it expires, the contract, before you make or lose a certain amount of money, you make nothing. But if you exercise your option, you have those shares that you bought, 100, 200, 300, whatever, thousands. It gives you the option to buy large bundles of shares that you normally wouldn't buy if you're not a mutual fund or a big group that can buy all those shares at one time because you have the capital for it. Yeah. It allows you to buy those at a price that you can afford. Huh. Interesting. I hear all the time of people losing their butts in options yeah. on it because they're not understanding it because they've been able to make like a small bet, but it winds up being so much more money. And that was what yeah. a lot of people when they were with the GameStop in AMC, <laughs> whenever that shot up and down, people yeah. shot up and down, people were like, hey, they're disrupting the options calls and puts for yeah. this company. Yeah. How did these major corporations lose the money off their calls and puts? What what was what was happening there? They were betting against the stock doing well. Everybody from because GameStop went bankrupt. So everybody that was betting on after the bankruptcy and up until the point where it jumped up, everybody was betting on it doing bad. And when you set a put option and you're betting on it doing bad, if you get the right price, like you pick the right price and the right expiration date, and that the two things meet between your price and the expiration date. If there's a long enough time and your price is right, when the stock hits that price, you'll make a bunch of money. So a limit. Yeah, there's a limit. Yeah. yeah. When, you, when you hit your limit, your price limit, you make a certain amount. In general, the movement from the current price to the price you picked, there's a profit or a loss in there, no matter what. Mm-hmm. And then if, if you get those shares before it expires, you'll have those shares available to you, but you won't make any more profit off of the price change. You'll just get what you have. Gotcha. And, and whatever movement those shares make, you have those shares and they move. But you're able to buy more shares or change more shares when your contracts are still open. Gotcha. And that's why I recommend this for anyone that's going into stocks in general in this. Have your stop and have your limit on where it hits, where it's going to be able to sell at, or it's going to be able to sell at when it's at a negative or or a limit where it's be able to sell when it hits a certain amount, if that's your risk comfort zone to be able to do so. That's not for everyone, but that's something to think about of, hey, if, if I know that I paid $40 for it and I'm willing to let it go at 43 because that's what the money I wanted to make, yeah. cool. And if I'm saying, hey, I know that it's, if it drops down to 40 that's that's where I don't feel comfortable anymore. Yeah. I want it to go away. You may be taking your loss at eight dollars per share kind of deal, but that's your comfort zone kind of in that level. Yeah. So that's something just to think about. Yeah, know your limits. Yeah. Once you hit yes. your limit, stop there. Yeah. Now there, this is the one that everybody, these two everybody is, is loving about, everyone wants to know about is cryptocurrencies and <laughs> NFTs. That yeah. is the new yeah. biggest thing right now. Yeah. What is cryptocurrency? Okay. So cryptocurrency is a digital form of currency that is the currency of the metaverse. Everything on the internet now is able to be bought with these digital forms of currency that are essentially exchange currencies. They allow you to go between currencies and make purchases in the metaverse or the the quotations you're doing. (laughs) Yeah, because the metaverse still doesn't like fully exist. But the current form of the metaverse we have right now is cryptocurrencies that are available like in certain countries their entire currency system has changed over to cryptocurrencies of different types between 
Dogecoin and Bitcoin and kind of the bigger ones that have more of a following and more of a they're decentralized, which means there's no real like there's restrictions no FDIC on FDIC protections yeah. and things yeah. like that. Yeah, there's no regulation on them yet. There's specific practices they have to follow, but there's no specific government regulation of a lot of them. So they're just kind of there and available for you to use. For me, for when I first got involved with cryptocurrencies, I had already been involved in foreign exchange or currency exchange. Yeah, Forex. Yeah, Forex. So just exchanging currencies from different countries like Australia, China, whatever, for the wand of the dollar, different things like that. And for me, that helped me make sense of what cryptocurrencies were actually doing. Because a lot of times with cryptocurrencies, you're going to go from one currency, from your American dollar to whatever currency you're going to buy. And then you may move from that currency to another one. Hopefully it profits for you. Yeah. And we're not going to talk about Forex going into that because that's a totally another world that we we agreed that we weren't going to discuss to kind of add on there. That was yeah. one of those ones we... We have some knowledge in it, but it's not something enough to put out there. For sure. (laughs) For sure. But so ultimately, is it like letters and numbers and stuff that's kind of just floating in the universe? Because of right now, a lot of people are seeing their accounts hacked. Yeah. And they're seeing... Okay, so yeah. Like, what's up with that? Cryptocurrency works off of digital contracts. When you buy a cryptocurrency, you're essentially saying, hey... I agree to take this currency with the risks that come with this digital form of money. And what happens is when you're exchanging those currencies, they're coded. So it's code, but it's not as secure as some things can be. It's very secure, but because it's digital and it's online and people on the internet have access to it, anything can be hacked because somebody's creating it. Yeah. But they're very secure, actually. Most of them are very secure and very well set up. It's just because they're being facilitated, like because of the platforms that are facilitating your access to cryptocurrencies, sometimes those actual access points, if you want to call them them, they're not as secure as they should be. Like Bitcoin, Uh, all the other ones, like Bitcoin, Dogecoin, Shiba Inu, whatever coin you're talking about, the coins themselves are very secure, but the platforms you access them through may not be, which is how they're getting hacked. Usually, so it's not it. it's not Bitcoin getting hacked. It's this platform that's allowing you access to Bitcoin is getting gotcha. hacked. Gotcha. So that's yeah that okay that's something I did not know at all how uh, it came to that. Now the price is always jumping up and down. It's it's yeah. heavily right now with the way the, it's so volatile. Yeah. The someone sees the price at say it's. 32,450 and they go, Hey, I want to go and sell it. The problem is, is uh, some platforms I know uh, Robinhood got in trouble because it's like, Hey, you tried to sell it at 32, but it takes like five minutes or half a day to process. Yeah. And whenever it sold, it yeah. was like 30. Yeah. And they're like, Wait a minute, but I sold it at yeah. 32. And that's what's, because what's Robinhood's that? so new. A lot of the stuff they're doing, like they just recently added crypto trading. So a lot of their stuff is just, they have it coded in as an option that you can use to trade cryptocurrencies, but actually facilitating that trade takes a minute because it's such a new thing on the platform itself. Gotcha. Because so even some issues. trades on Robinhood, just because I use Robinhood, some trades take a minute, which is why you ha- kind of have to facilitate that in a certain way when you do it. Yeah. You kind of have to know what you're trying to do right. Not You don't want to make the trade immediately when you need to happen. You kind of want to know right before... Give yourself some time yeah. to be able to make that trade because it's not instantaneous sometimes with certain stocks because of who's facilitating the trade between Robinhood and that company. Sometimes they're going through a third party company to ah. get access to certain stocks. Same as with crypto, probably Robinhood's using something else to facilitate. It's probably not directly with a uh, Bitcoin or Dogecoin or whatever that they're able to actually give you access to those cryptocurrencies. Gotcha. Which is why it may take longer, like you said, a day or more. I've never had to take a day, but I've definitely had it where like I noticed that I needed to do it early enough to get it to trade, to sell or buy when it was making these movements. Gotcha. Now, what platforms have you found is a little easier to use? Because I know you're saying Robinhood, mm-hmm. they said they have to get a third party. Mm-hmm. Like what is, what about a second or first party to make sure you can be able to get the most out of your cryptocurrency when selling that? A first party platform for cryptocurrencies I've used is called Coinbase. Okay. Coinbase has always been good for all cryptocurrencies I wanted to access. Their trades are instantaneous crypto-wise because all they do is crypto. People that have a little more money to use might do better with Crypto.com, which is another platform a lot of people use. 
Other than that, there are smaller ones that I've heard about, but those are the main ones I've had success with. Gotcha. One more I would say is a platform called Binance that I like a lot because that's good for the metrics on cryptocurrencies. Like if you're trying to buy a cryptocurrency, it gives you all the metrics you need to be able to say, hey, this is what I want to actually invest in. It tells you everything you need to know past, present, and kind of a little bit future. Like this is what it might do based on what we've seen other cryptocurrencies do because they have access to kind of all the cryptocurrencies. That's where you're looking at chart analysis right there. Exactly. You see all the different five metrics and charts yeah, exactly. there. Exactly. Now people are asking that I, I posted up some questions and yeah. curious from people was what is a wallet that you're looking at for the cryptocurrencies? Yeah. Cause I'm not pulling out like my physical yeah. thing going, here's one dollar. Yeah. Like I can't walk up to a counter and go, I have point zero 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 seven cryptocurrency. Yeah. Cha ching. Like what is this digital wallet? Okay. So a digital wallet or crypto wallet is essentially not like a, I don't want to say like a bank account, but it's, it's it's essentially a digital place where you can keep all your cryptocurrencies organized and secure. It makes sure that all the cryptocurrencies you have are available whenever you need them and can be used for whatever you want to use them for. Most platforms and a few web browsers have access to crypto or digital wallets that you, you can kind of use when you're buying some on Amazon or things like that so that you can have access to cryptocurrencies like you have access to your regular currencies. Because a lot of people regularly are going to use money for online. A lot of online purchases are the main form of purchases people are making. A lot of yeah. people still go in person, but a lot of transactions are happening online. So it gives you instant access to your cryptocurrencies at any time you're making a purchase. Like it's kind of right where your shortcuts are. And it gives you the shortcut to your cryptocurrencies to buy things with. Gotcha. So I, and I, I know a lot of places are starting to accept it more as currency to be exactly. able to use in their marketplace. Yep, yep. So at that point, you're using your wallet and it's converting it to whatever value it is at that point in time, almost like a currency extra exchange and then paying that company. Yes, say. because every cryptocurrency has a value against the dollar. Yes. Based on its current value. Your digital wallet seems to automatically kind of trade over what you already have available in your digital wallet in that currency to dollars. Gotcha. Interesting. Now, do you think, I know a lot of countries are starting to change and think, hey, we're putting ourselves solely on cryptocurrencies or exactly. we're evolving. What do you think the possible future is in the United States? Do you think we're going to eventually go towards it or not? This is going to opinion-based questions. This is not cool, answers. Yeah. I mean, the United States... Uh, regulation is the big holdback right yeah, now. Yeah, it, it, United States like regulation in everything. Yeah. So gotcha. for me, regulation with marijuana is similar to how I feel that people are going to move forward in the government in terms of cryptocurrency. Okay. Because states have legalized it, but it's not everywhere. But yeah, as soon as the government yeah. can guarantee their money and profit off of this thing when they regulate it, then it'll become available for everybody. Same with for me, marijuana or anything like that with cannabis. Because until the government can make full full and well they're going to make a profit off of it, they're not going to do it. Uncle Sam's always going to find his dollar. He's yeah. going to want to be able to make in there. And that be. seems to be the only reason I see why it won't be regulated and it won't be immediately available in our markets. Otherwise, we have all the infrastructure in the works to make it where we can all use it for everything. Interesting thoughts. I never would have thought of that comparison there. But no, it's true because you look at Colorado, you look at Illinois... You look at all these different states that have put it out there of how heavily it's regulated and put into place to be able to make that change. Hmm. Interesting. That's yeah. a, I love that comparison. Yeah. That really kind of put it into a different place for me. And I love how you'll be able to break it down for me to, to a different level because yeah. that's, that's awesome. You're doing a phenomenal job, by the way. Thank Compliments. you. Appreciate Welcome. it. Appreciate it. Now, this is one that I have. I, I mean, my students are always talking about it. And this one I do not get. I've been able to read a little bit about cryptocurrency and figure it out. Sure. NFTs, man. Okay. What I, I get that it's art based and also you're purchasing like someone's physical rights on something. What is an NFT, man? Okay. So NFTs are for me a form of not digital currency, but cultural currency, I would say. Because it seems like they have virtual worlds, trading cards, songs, domain names, collectibles. Everything that you're accessing is a piece of the metaverse that's coming. All okay. these things will be readily available in the metaverse. That's what you're buying them for. 
most people that are buying them, the profits they're making off of them or anything else, these will only be actually usable in the metaverse in the future. Like even recently, I worked with a friend to set up their mission statement for their NFT they're trying to bring, like their their NFT project they're doing. But for me, the metaverse is the only place that NFTs are going to be usable. Right now, everything, everything that everybody's buying NFT-wise is just going to be moved to the metaverse where it's usable. Otherwise, you can't really use a CryptoPunk. It's just got money in it and it's valuable. But you can't really move a CryptoPunk to anywhere and use it in a transaction or anything like that or put it in your house, really. You could say you have it on your computer, yeah. but a CryptoPunk will only be valuable in the metaverse. And when the metaverse becomes a real place you can access, these will be everywhere. They'll be in their own museums. They'll be everywhere around you. But right now, they're just online and you could buy them and people think that they're great, so they're hedging them, essentially. So you're essentially buying like a copyright? Is that like an equivalent? It's like a copyright because you, like, like I said, you could buy snippets of songs, you could buy artwork. Problem is, I don't, I don't really see much copyright going on with art pieces. For me, yeah. NFTs work like how a lot of wealthier families or wealthier groups of people have pieces of art they'll keep in their home yes. to hold value for tax purposes and things like that. That's what they're going to be good for in the metaverse. You'll have thousands, millions of dollars just in NFTs because in the metaverse, it'll hold its value. In real life, artwork holds its value and it's it used as an asset. Same as these, they're assets to be used in a certain arena or environment. So if I have this picture of a cat, I'm just throwing this out That's there. That's going to be an NFT. Uh, if yeah. it's an NFT, and if someone wants to use it, it's almost like royalty. They have to pay me to use this cat? Is that, am I understanding as that correctly? As long as you make it an NFT, it's yours. And then you can sell it. And then it can gain value only if you decide to make it available for everyone else to buy. Otherwise, it's just yours. So it's just mine. No one else can use it. But if I want someone to use it, they have to buy it. They have the to buy thing, it from or you. Or they buy no, no, right they buy. It. They buy a version of it. You yourself will have yours, but they'll have a version of what you have made your NFT to be. Okay. Speaking of cats, my cat- I hear the cat. (laughs) My cat was like, no, I heard cats. So that's like quite ironic. Okay. So, wow, that's- it's a lot that the metaverse as it's kind of grow. Yeah. I don't, I'm very curious to see how this goes because it's still, I feel like an old man here. I'm like, I'm so confused. It's still, it's, it's a lot still out there. weird to me. I'm looking forward to it's it. It's the wild, wild west. Last thing I wanted to say about NFTs. Oh, keep talking because I was just making a comment. No, you're good. Last thing I want to say about them is it seems like they're going to find following like artwork finds value. They're going to find value like artwork finds value. Only certain audiences will buy certain ones, which means. Certain ones, as you've seen in the actual market of NFT, certain ones will gain a following while other ones will just be there. Like There's a bunch of artwork pieces that will not be worth millions of dollars, and there's others that will be because there's a certain audience for them. Now, how does someone purchase or sell an NFT? So we didn't talk about platforms yet, but there's a platform yeah, called platform. OpenSea. Yeah. OpenSea has available all different types of platforms and um, different types of NFTs. And you'd go in... And like I said, because it's the metaverse, they're all bought with cryptocurrencies, all of them. Every every type of NFT on the market currently is available for a certain amount in cryptocurrency. Okay, interesting. Most of them are Bitcoin, Dogecoin, but it all depends on what that platform is using. And so anybody can make something and be able to put it on there? They have to get like approval or how does that work? It, to- it all depends on the platform you're using to put your NFT onto the market. Huh. So they have different agreements depending on what your NFT is going to be in the platform you're using. Okay. Interesting. That's pretty cool that that's, again, still growing, evolving. Yeah. And I look yeah. forward to hearing more and more about it. And as time goes along, I'm sure in the next like five years, I'll look back at this and be like, wow, man, I should have invested X, Y, and Z in this. Yeah. Something like that yeah. as it goes along. But that's, again, that, that's kind of part of it that's out there as things change and evolve. We have to, what does it say, evolve or die? Yeah. Thing is, something like that. So now... You've read a lot of books. You've put in a lot of time here. How much time do you think that you have actually put in to learning over these two years? That's a big old question because I'm sure it's a boatload of time. Can you specify the question? Okay, yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. I, wow, I just probably put that out there. So you put a lot of time into yes. studying for the past two years. Yes. How much time 
over these two years have you put in? Would you say I spend an average of five hours a day? Cool. Okay. Or I spend, you know, out of a week, I know I'm going to block out 50 hours, like a job or yeah. something. So the first year, I spent almost every day as many hours as I could. Currently, I spend anywhere between an hour and a half and two hours just because I kind of know what I want to do coming into the market. And I know what I want to get out of that kind of time I'm putting in. Just for me, it's optimal to use the two hours I use every day. Because I do every day I'm in the market. There's not a day I'm not in the market, but I've, I spend way less time than I did when I started. Because coming in, like I said, I spent every day with my actual outside research and my physical materials. I spent my research in my online material. And then I actually just spent time in the market doing research on what the market was doing every day. Yeah, and that's uh, keeping up. The more time you invest in it, yeah. you really can either wing yourself back or know where your focus is to not have to waste so much For time sure. everywhere. Also, at this point, because I've spent so much time in it, if I spend too much time in a day in the market, I'm going to just overthink what I'm seeing. Like I cannot spend all day in the market and benefit from it at this point. That's true. Now, how do you handle your taxes on this? Because that's a capital gains, capital yeah. losses. Like, yeah. what, what? how do you do that? So a lot of the paperwork and taxes that I would normally need to do, Robinhood provides a lot of those forms for you. Oh, nice. like they keep a lot of that, the metrics. They give you earnings reports that you have, and then it kind of keeps a record of what trades you've made and things like that so that you can just turn that in to the IRS and say, hey, this is what I made. This is what I did. These are the, what I mounts I made. And you you could do your own stuff, but because Robinhood's connected to TurboTax or something. TurboTax. Yeah, because Robinhood's connected to TurboTax, they give you a lot of those forms just in your actual account. Oh, nice. That makes things easy. Yeah. I know TD Ameritrade does some of that stuff as well on it, but it's, you got to know to access yeah. it. You but that partnership it makes it very easy. Yeah. yeah. And if you don't, the government will find a way to get it. True. So true, true, think true. about that. Just make sure that you're doing your taxes, people, because if not, the government will find you in some way, form, or fashion. Now, besides investing in these marks and stuff, what else do you do for investing? Like, are you, Specify are you the question, at, like, hey, please. Do you invest in startup companies? Do you oh, invest yeah. in real yeah. estate? What yeah. is your... Outside of just investing, there's a platform called Diversify that me and my mom currently invest in that allows you to invest in real estate, the REI type stuff, where you can invest in groups of properties. You put in whatever kind of amount you want to put in, but your minimum investment is a certain amount. And then you make whatever you make similar to dividends with stocks, you make that amount back based on the properties they have and the returns you're getting on those properties that they're making profits on. Okay. Outside of that, I've done a little bit of startup investing in two different platforms. Those allow me access to startups. I do very little of that just because once you make the investment in those companies, minimum investment or not, you're just waiting for them to go public, essentially. If they don't go public, then you'll have your shares and they'll hold their value depending on what kind of agreement you want to have with them when you originally invest in them. Smart to diversify yourself. That's exactly. The thing yeah. always I'm never going to stick with one thing for sure. <laughs> well, that's, you never know where the market's going to go, what it's going to do. So you have to have, what's the word I'm looking for here? Not side hustles, but you got to have your, a lot of irons in the fire. Diversification is very important. Yeah, it entirely is. Thank you for saving me on that one because my brain good. was good. That's, that's a term we have to know as investors. <laughs> yes, exactly. Now, what advice would you give someone saying that they are wanting to start this adventure into the world? We've given some of this information out here. You've mentioned a lot of wonderful nuggets here. Can you give me, by me, I mean our listeners, yeah. a wrap up of what's something that they want to start today? What should, what do you recommend? Okay. So, any starting investor, I would say to come in. As I've stated earlier, you need to know how much you're going to invest, how much you want to make off that investment, and then you have to also be willing to do a certain amount of research coming in. The type of investing I would say for an investor to come in and do, I would say stocks are the best way to just come into investment to make some money. Because most people in investments are trying to make some money originally and then move over to another type of investment. If you feel like another type of investment is going to work better for you once you've done your research. A starting stock, I think anybody could start with would be a Facebook or a Twitter or any of like the social media type platforms. And if your platform you're 
going to start with, if it has a thing called fractional shares, that's perfect for any starting investor because that allows uh, you to kind of come in at whatever amount you can put in first. So if you have your goal, you have your percentage you want to get and you've done your research, fractional shares, when it's available to you from your platform, allows you to come in with whatever amount you have on hand and say, hey, I want this much per share of this based on how much money you actually have to put in. Yes, yeah, kind of like with cryptocurrencies of, hey, I own 0.00007 of yeah. it. And that's say when the stock is you own like Facebook, if you wanted to walk in and buy a, I can't remember how much it is right now, but a couple of hundred dollars or a thousand dollars, can't remember how much it is. Exactly. It's, I don't have that kind of money to drop in, but buying fractional, meaning I can still gain some profits and stuff on there. From exactly. It. Smart and entirely intelligent to think about that. We're going to wind down here. We're coming down towards an, an end here. What is some last minute words of advice? It doesn't have to be about what we've talked about today. It can be about what we've talked about. Maybe something we didn't talk about. What would you like to throw out there to the Learning From Friends universe? Everybody is trying to find an area of stocks to invest in. Always look at EVs and cannabis stocks just coming in. I know I've noted the Facebooks and everything else for people coming into the market, but future-wise, look at those two as investment areas for sure. That's true that they're, every market... And time is going to have a different time period that's going to be like for a while, the internet website.com bubble yeah. was a big thing. Understand, I guess, when to get in, understand when to get out, yeah. be constantly aware of it. But yeah, right now, the, that wave is changing. The biomedical field is blowing up right now of going in and out, in and out exactly. as well. And that's the cannabis part I'm talking about. Yeah. And then the EV thing, because there's so much focus on Tesla and electric vehicle projects coming from a lot of the bigger actual car companies. They're, they're getting into it now, which means you'll have access to that when normally you wouldn't be able to. Great advice. Wonderful things for coming in and sharing with us today. Thank you. Like, this is amazing. Thank you. If someone wanted to reach out to you, just had a question or was curious, maybe they wanted to follow you on some social media or something like that, how could they get a hold of Rodney or watch, watch Rodney do his thing? All right, cool. So Rodney has a Facebook, Rodney has an email, and Rodney has a phone number. You can say it if you cool. want to pin there. If not, right. you can say, hey, email me, Cade, which is C-A-D-E at learningfromfriends.com. I'll put you in place or no. What do you want to offer okay. the guests? So I am Rodney, R-O-D-N-E-Y, Baskerville, B-A-S-K-E-R-V-I-L-L-E-J-R, Jr. That's me on Facebook. My email is... First name, last name I just spelled, and junior at gmail.com. And then my phone number, because I don't know a lot of these people yet. They'll probably just text me. 470-357-1137. Not going to lie, that's brave putting your phone number. I don't know if I put up my phone number, <laughs> but that's awesome. <laughs> right, I got to get a follow him. Just text me, man. <laughs> that's like, you heard him. Text him. Don't call him at 2 a.m. in the morning. He's on Eastern Standard Time. For sure. Don't, don't all of a sudden West Coast be like, oh, I'm going to call Rodney and mess with Rodney. Don't call and mess with him. Be honest. If you want to know something, be kind, be courteous. You know, don't don't be a jerk. And Keep Kate has my number. So yeah, send him all the questions you want and he'll get to me at some point. <laughs> this is true. I can get to him that way if you want to reach out that way for me. Well, to get information, Rodney, I don't know. I can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing this with us. Thank you, sir. It is an honor. As we get ready to wrap down here, if you want to be able to follow me, I am on Learning From Friends podcast, which is on Facebook. It is on Twitter. I'm hoping by this point in December or November, wherever we're at, I should have a Patreon put up there. If you want yes. to donate, yes, put in yes, there. Yes. Please do. There's a lot of money that goes into this. I don't do advertising. I am a teacher. I'm self-funded, self-put out there. I don't want to put commercials on this. So feel free, even if it's a dollar. I'm down for it. I pay little subscriptions to be able to editing software and buy new equipment. And I take a lot of my guests out to dinners or lunch or breakfast or buy them coffee or something. So you can help good. you can help fund a meal like the three steak quesadillas that Rodney got this evening <laughs> from Taco yes, Bell. For sure. So yeah, just just kind of think about that. Feed your artists in some way, form, or fashion. Definitely episode that I did earlier this year with nonprofits. Donate to nonprofits, donate to organizations and things that you like to see so they can continue in any way, form, or fashion. So just throwing that out there. Fun I'm not a nonprofit. In. I'm for profit. <laughs> for sure. So, I'll, well, I'm not really for profit. I, I want to go, I just want to break even. That's my big thing. I just want to break sure. even at the end of the day. So, 
as do listeners, you leave out. Hope you all are well. Hope you're being safe in your space, that you are, that you're learning, that you're growing. Share this podcast with your friends, your neighbors, your cats, your dogs, whatever you feel like someone could be able to learn and grow from it, do it. And as you leave out today, the most important thing that I like to leave my guests with is don't forget to let your curiosity fly high. This is Kay Curtis, your tour guide from learning from friends. Friends.